absolutely wild as Fern Gagne's all-star wrestling goes coast to coast and continent to continent. The greatest wrestlers in the world. He may be an apprentice carpenter, but I guarantee you he is a seasoned ring veteran. I've been hit with bar stools, bar rags, bar maids. I'm talking to you! They're scared that Hulkamania is still running wild. Oh, yeah. I got a big fat wife and nine kids at home, and I gotta feed them. And take a look at Jesse the body in real life. Open your hand once if you would. You want to see it? <laughs> this is absolutely unbelievable. Totally, completely out of control. He's coming in over the top. Hey! Look out! Hello, everybody. Welcome into the number one preeminent podcast dedicated to the American Wrestling Association. We are AWA Unleashed. My name is Chris Tubbs. I bring you in. Let's bring in the uh, the other two fellas that are a part of this as my camera's a little bit blurry. So I'm going to add Joe and I'm going to add Mick and hopefully their cameras are going to be a little bit better because I think that's an omen, guys. I think that's an omen because today... I'm just, when I do this, okay? Okay. <laughs> See this? I got it. Where's the pole? It's right up top. <laughs> this should tell you all you need to know about today's show, right? I mean, <laughs> do we really need an introduction after that? You know, it says it all right there. The giblets, the stuffing, and everything else. We we got it all this week. Yeah. This one is going to be interestingly fun. And I got to admit, a bit challenging to sort of do a takeoff of what we're going to be well, talking about today. Can you be a little serious, though? Uh, you know, we could we can approach it as a team. <laughs> It'll be a, it'll be a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I, it, it, okay, it's time for us to get series started. <laughs> oh, that may be challenging. Wow. <laughs> but we can do it as a team if we stay serious. Good night, everybody. <laughs> that was so bad. We were, we were what so a, what a, you all losers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where's Jake Melliman where you need him? Oh, oh gosh. Okay. We're there talking about the Team Challenge Series, you guys, and we're going to have some fun because, let's be honest, this is this is a wart on the history of the AWA. There, there's no question about it, but this is also, I feel, guys, a part of the history that you can't, you can't ignore because there are a lot of, of individuals in my age group that this is a part of our, our history of the AWA. This is what we remember. For better or for worse, this, I mean, we, we have to cover it, right? We, we can't just ignore it. I mean, this, yeah, this is. <laughs> yeah. There, there I'm going to go, go put my turkey away, by the way. <laughs> that's not, uh, we don't want to watch that. There are. Um, I'll be back in 20 seconds. There he goes. He's going to put He's gonna put the turkey away. Here, uh, let me put you full screen, Nick. I'll remove myself. All right. There we go. Okay, perfect. Uh Here's the thing. Hold on. The turkeys haven't been put away yet. We're on screen. Oh. Gobble, gobble. Go ahead, Mick. I know. Gobble, it, gobble it, is right. Just yeah, wanted to follow up the poor intro with another poor intro. By it me. doesn't matter. We've lost the whole audience anyway. So <laughs> it's just us. Uh, this is going to be an interesting show, Joe. See, I told you uh, it didn't take me long to put away my turkey. That sounds like a personal issue. But, uh, Joe... You were there. Uh, you were heavily involved, um, as has been documented, whether you like it or not, uh, in the production of the Team Challenge series. As Chris said, it is not the AWA's greatest uh, legacy, but you can't ignore it. You can't pretend that the AWA was thriving until 1987 and then the door shut down. No. There were some subsequent uh, hiccups in the final years of the AWA. And might as well get right into it because the Team Challenge Series is one of the most talked about, for good or bad, uh, debacles in the history of wrestling. 
there you see old Vernsky, and there is a story, as you said before we came out, about the, the girls behind Vern in this shot. Yeah, so, I, I mean, we could... We're going to be all over the map. I mean, where do you start? Where do you, you know, move on to with the team challenge series? Um, the the shot that we, that we had up there was of uh, of Vern and his dog uh, was grabbed from um, the open to the new AWA, and uh, Vern was out on his deck explaining this new concept, this new approach that's going to revolutionize the world of professional wrestling. And of course, that did not materialize. One of the revolutionary ideas uh, involved the gals that were in that background shot. Um, the... The Team Challenge Series, and, and I'm going all over because I'm just, I'm having flashbacks for better or for worse. The Team Challenge Series went all over the place with no rhyme or reason. So, you know, it, it fits right in. Very true. I mean, there there's the graphics. Chris, could you go back to the picture of Vern as I'm setting this up, please? So one of the many different ideas was to incorporate... Um, shall we just, I'll call it what it is, incorporate more sexiness into the AWA. And the girls in the background there were actually oil wrestlers from a, a, a gentleman's club in downtown Minneapolis. And we actually went and this was upstairs. They had a little oil ring pit. And we went what, upstairs. Was it the boo? Was it the boo? I believe, yeah, deja vu. I, I had forgotten uh, the name of it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we shot for the entire day with the girls getting different type of things. We got them wrestling in the ring and so forth. And the shoot ended up, just as a, as a side note, the shoot ended up taking all day. I mean, I was there for, I want to say about nine hours. And at the end of it, it's like, okay, tired. The, the, the public started coming in, had my gear there. And I said, I haven't eaten all day. I'm going to stay and eat, have a cocktail. And during that time, as I'm, I'm sitting there um, um, with another production guy, and the girls start oil wrestling. And what the setup was that they, um, they, they, they auctioned themselves off so that you could go in and oil wrestle. And I'm like, I'm sitting there just like, and this is like 1987-ish. And so I'm like, what? These guys are paying like $100, $200 to be able to go in and oil wrestle these guys. So this, there, there was a one, this one gal who I guess I'll age myself and say that I was smitten with, I thought was very attractive. She was very nice all day, had red, white, and blue bikini that was, she was wearing. And a gentleman a few tables over from where I was sitting at the time in the back of the bar um, won the bid, he proceeded to then come up to me and tap me on the shoulder and goes, I don't want to go up there. Would you go up there for me? I'm like, the guy just spent a couple of hundred bucks. Not all heroes wear capes, Joe. Yeah. So I was like, okay, if I have to go in, I will do it. So random acts of I kindness. went in there, you know, they, they gave wow. you, they gave you large oversized, you know, trunks, I felt like... Uh, um, well, you I, certainly didn't need the oversized trunks. Yeah, I knew that was coming. But they were like... They were, they, I look like MC Hammer, but in trunks. Are we okay, 45 that, minutes how, into this, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> no, and oh, so, yeah. anyway, so I get in. I It was three <laughs> two-minute rounds. The first guy, the other guy that was in there 
got booted after the first round for being too handsy and too grabby. So now all of a sudden, it's a handicap match. It's me against two girls in a bikini oil wrestling match. So I took one for the team. You know, you, you, wow. have, the, you have the heart of a lion. And <laughs> coincidentally, ladies and gentlemen, that was the best match of the entire team challenge series. It yeah, was, where was, where, where, where it was, was never recorded, thankfully. Actually, it was recorded. <laughs> well, you are... Uh, We're you, talking about really being a team something. player. He's a team uh, player. I, I mean, honestly, I, I, I just can't, I can't begin to tell you, you know, I, I wish I would have had the 200 bucks back, you know, back in the day, because I certainly would have dived in their head first. And, you know, <laughs> Dive in where? Put, Never mind. Put, put, put the girls over, as they say. But anyway. So, so that, the, was, that was before the Team Challenge series ever even saw the air. Did you, pin him, been like an omen. Yeah, did, did you pin him like Frankie DeFalco? No, I did not bite any groin area. After the first guy got kicked out, I was as gentlemanly as I could possibly be. And I just enjoyed the, the, the full six minutes in the ring, being covered in oil and having two very attractive women wow, beat I, me up. You know, I really envy you for lasting six minutes. That is... Uh, <laughs> Five minutes and 55 seconds longer than you would have. Absolutely. You know, but in wrestling, we shave time anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, and this is all on a production shoot at the very beginning. Like, this is all, yeah, like Mick said, that's kind of an omen, isn't it? Like, you just kind of knew that this thing was, well, it was going to be a little different from the very so beginning. For me, for me, I had high hopes for the Team Challenge Series because that's how it started for me. Joe, I think... Being all in all serious now that we're halfway through the show, what I would say, the Team Challenge Series, yes, in theory, it was a great idea. It was going to be innovative. It was going to be novel, something a little bit different. But the the execution of the Team Challenge Series, and maybe, you know, not your fault, you know, you're going back 30 years or whatever, Production uh, sometimes uh, uh, took a little hit. Uh, there you see r ringside Ralph Strangis on the left. And uh, ringside Ralph had a tendency to uh, a little bit of hyperbole in putting over the Team Challenge Series. And there's Greg Gagne. Greg looks uh, reasonably amused, or he's thinking, what did I get myself into? One or the other. Uh, but nonetheless, again, in execution, it didn't quite come off the way I think it was initially envisioned. Not whatsoever. Uh, so the whole concept started, um, there was a producer. Uh, I remember his first name was Nick, but I can't remember what his last name is. He had done television and uh, he got brought into the AWA to shake things up production wise Quite. was it was it was it nick franzen um could just, have been okay okay just just curious yeah I, I i if i saw him i would remember him i uh I, to me what i remember of this nick that i'm referring to uh he could have been uh cast from monty python's flying circus uh, he looked like a, a, a British guy. But anyway, so Nick came in and and changed everything. Um, he <sighs> wanted to do it in a studio, um, wanted to do green screen of the talent coming in. Um, you saw, you know, bringing <laughs> in oil wrestling girls into the show. He really wanted to do something different and shake it up. And that included the Team Challenge series. After the first tapings, Vern had one of his OGs moments and Nick was, was gone. But the commitment to the Team Challenge series was already there. And so... Vern and Greg and 
Mike Shields, everybody wanted to just let it run. You know, th this is what was planned for a long time. And where the AWA was at that point, it's like, okay, we can't change <laughs> midstream. We needed to do, to make the best of, a, shall I say, a poor or bad decision. The AWA at that point, and we've talked about this many times, they were throwing things at the wall to see if they would stick. They wanted to somehow stand out uh, from what WWF and even NWA were doing at the time. In theory, you know, when they first announced this team talent series, I thought this is going to be tremendous because mm -hmm. if I re recall, there was a, a meeting room with this big placard behind it with all these wrestlers that were potentially going to be in the team challenge series. And you saw some big names on the placard, on the whiteboard, none of whom, unfortunately, ever surfaced in the AWA team challenge series. Uh, so the, the, the idea at the beginning, I think it was kind of exciting. You're, you're, you're talking about all kinds of things. And there we see lethal Larry Cameron, Certainly one bright spot in the Team Challenge Series and the AWA in general at the time. And I know Chris is going to be putting up uh, mm -hmm. some pictures as we go here of the participants, at least a good number of them, uh, that were in the Team Challenge Series. But again, the whole idea, basically, in case you don't know, was that you had these teams. You had Sarge's, was it Sarge's Snipers? And Baron's Blitzers and Larry's Legends. It was Sergeant Slaughter, Baron Von Raschke, and Larry Zabisco were the team captains. <laughs> and uh, and there you see it right there. And I'm not even sure those numbers add up in, in, in terms of totals. So, you know, white wins, losses, and draws. But if your team or your singles match, whatever it was, you would get points for a victory. The winning team at the end of this team challenge series would get one million dollars now i don't think anybody on the planet thought that the awa could come up with one million dollars back in the day uh, petty cash that's petty cash yeah yeah sh sure was well and you know what i had cost them millions or so they were already going in the hole yeah there you go but everybody knew you know that, that come on you're, you're you're telling us that for this production, you're gonna you're gonna give the rock and roll guy and whoever else a million dollars if they win the team talent series. So you got that going, and you got the talent not quite being what you expected, and there was no feuds to speak of. This is the one thing that I I didn't get with this whole team challenge series, Joe. Well, I, I, can I can I follow up with something yeah. with you, Joe? Here, could you mention this is something that was already planned? How long was the Team Challenge series scheduled to run from like beginning to end? Did you guys have like a a, a definite like this is how long we want this thing to go, or was it just kind of open ended? Pretty much open ended. Okay. You know, okay. it, it, we 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 didn't know how this was going to take. I mean, it it changed right out of the starting gate when after Nick left, or Vern didn't you know want to work with him anymore. Mm -hmm. Then it just became a let's see what we can do. And was there a sense of panic at that point? Then no, not panic. You know, just a what the hell are we going to do? I mean, it was. The only thing different from any regular wrestling show is, is um, creating the angles within the Team Challenge series okay. Okay. as opposed to going off of what was there. And, Mick, you're right. I mean, there really wasn't anything. But, it, you know, I, 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 I could sort of compare the Team Challenge series concept as far as the angles and so forth with what the NBA is currently doing, the in-season tournament. Um, neither really makes sense to me. It's just something different that was tried. And as far as the team challenge series, it became uh, like really just a fresh, clean slate start that got dirty and messy real quick. 
that's the thing. You know, it, it, to me, if you're going to hook an audience, Joe, you're not going to get them with this. The team is going to win a million dollars. Nobody gave a shit. Come on. They, they did. They knew that wasn't going to happen. So you have to have these built in feuds, the rivalries, something to get the attention of the fans other than three points for a, you know, a victory, two points for a draw, disqualification. You lose a point, whatever it might be. And so, so I, to me, when I watched it almost from the beginning, I thought, no, you know, this is not what I anticipated this is going to be. And I just kind of knew right from the get go, this wasn't going to go anywhere. And then to watch the subsequent production, if you will, with the, with the chroma key and the green screen. And I know you got a story about the cheering wild fans that would watch the uh, the show in bars and restaurants around Minneapolis, it just came off to me as real desperation. And well, yet, so it, it the, was. The, the angle of the Team Challenge series was, there's Tommy Jammer. Tommy Jammer, yes. The, the, the Team Challenge series was intended to be the angle. And that is where you've got three teams and it was team versus team versus team. Now I'm not saying I, for the record, I did not come up with anything on the team challenge series. I just sat in production and I did what I was told to do. So um, I had to say that because I don't want to take blame for the team challenge series. Having said that, who came up with it? Um, Greg and Nick in the in the office, shall you say? You know, keep in mind again the time period, nineteen eighty seven ish, and mm -hmm. you're looking. Um, this kayfabe was still in existence. Greg Gagne was uh, and still is a huge sports fan, and so part of the idea was to try to get professional wrestling into a professional sports mode. Okay. where the three teams in the Team Challenge series were all vying. There was no regular season. It was more that was the entire playoffs and building up to see who is going to get the most points at the end and get the mythical million dollars at the end. So that was the whole concept behind it. You know, they, there are a lot of great ideas, but the execution of them turns any decent idea into a horseshit one. I think if you look at it, maybe it was ahead of its time. Maybe, you know, 10, 15 years later, and maybe it's not even in the AWA. Maybe it's in another promotion where the production values and the glitz and the glamour will coincide with something like this, uh, you know, and the million dollars or whatever with some credibility. But I think when you have fried chicken eating contests when you have turkey on a pole when you have eight ball battle royal and god knows what else and you've got green screen with a makeshift crowd uh you have people in bars and restaurants that are being told to cheer at the tv screen even though they don't know what the hell they're doing it just it just didn't work and again, I, I go back, I was disappointed because again, right at, from the start, I thought, you know, this is this is something good. Maybe, maybe people are gonna start paying attention to the AWA again, because you gotta remember, you know, there was the debacle of uh, Super Clash 3, uh, you know, eventually Twin Wars 90, you know, didn't work. So the AWA was really trying everything they could to get the focus back on them and say, hey, you know, we're different, we're innovative, we're hip whatever it might be, and too little, too late, I guess. Yeah, and, you know, I alluded earlier to 1987-ish, and I was, I, I want to say this would have been 89. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. so this would have been after Super Clash 3, so I just wanted to correct that. Um, but you're right, Mick. Um, you know, the, the, the production... Um, and again, keep in mind the time period. You know, this is not, late 80s. And it just, Vern didn't have, we, we didn't have the internal production capabilities 
that the WWF had or that the NWA had at the time. Um, it, it was straight cut. And so anything we needed to do that was special and unique, including something as basic uh, as chroma key, we had to go out of house for until Vern finally bought a chroma key card into one of the um, in, into the the, the uh, uh, video mixer, the gra old Grass Valley 100. Um, so I agree the ideas, the concepts, the the substance behind it uh, was decent. Execution of it, we just couldn't do it. And it was so different from traditional professional wrestling. And Nick's approach to it was so different that we just didn't get it executed in. And I don't think even with the best of production qualities, abilities at the time, I still don't think we would have we would have been able to get it done in the original presentation, doing it in the studio, Mr. Eric Bischoff, doing it in the studio without an audience and throwing in the chroma key stuff. It was it's almost not almost it was too different, too much different all at one time. And we just did not have the capability and the ability to do what we what we wanted to do with it. And again, I will concede and admit, even if we did, it wasn't going to save the AWA. No, and, and that was going to be my next point too, Joe. Looking at the time frame, it would be hard. It would be a hard sell to wrestling fans, even if you're trying to get them to look at you as doing something innovative and different, if you're at those abysmal Rochester TV tapings um, that were just horrible. I mean, when, when you think of the old AWA footage when they were coming from the St. Paul Civic Center seven or eight years earlier than that, you had 18, 19,000 people in the building. And now you're at Rochester where you're, you're struggling to get 1,000 people so what I would say is if you're going to do that, then you really need to establish storylines and feuds and make it somewhat attractive. So it sounds to me from what you're saying is that uh, this Nick, the production guy, was more into having fun or making an entertainment thing out of it, you know, with the team, with the, uh, the chicken eating contest and whatever else sounded like he was going to the WWF mindset at the time. And that was totally abhorrent to burn Gagne in the AWA. I don't get it. Well, he, you, you are correct, Nick. That's what Nick was trying to do, but Nick wasn't involved much beyond the initial. Okay couple of episodes the so chicken who, eating who idea ran, who ran with it then was it Vern and Greg that said okay I, I realized that they were stuck at that point mm -hmm. they made these commitments but at some point don't you just take a look at the product and say you know what we've got to get wrestling fans interested in a feud here we've got to get you know let's have some some cage matches not a Popeye's fried chicken eating contest or a turkey on a pole match it just to me, it, it was just just a debacle. I was not a fan of the Team Challenge series in any way, shape, or form. It became um, it, it became a gimmick that got out of control. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, from the chicken eating contest to a you know turkey on a pole match, it was a desperate grasp at trying to. Just do something. Um, what What was the most absurd out of all of the the gimmick matches that happened? Is it the Is it the fried chicken eating contest? Is it because those are the two that we remember? Is there one that you feel? Well, both of you guys are there. Ones that you just feel was just way over the top. And I know that's kind of a <laughs> and it's kind of a a weird question to ask because it's all over the top. I'm going with the turkey on the pool match. I mean, it's probably the most infamous part, and it's the one that brings it all up. And I just say that yeah. because it was like the for the that was the big shebang. 
Good point, Joe. And I would also agree with the turkey on a pole match because it had some notoriety. You know, the thing with, with the chicken eating contest or the eight ball, whatever, you know, behind the eight ball. Got an, eight, an, eight, an eight ball battle royal. <laughs> that's got a completely different meaning now. Oh, yeah, there you, know, you guys, go. Guys would legitimately shoot to get to that. There you <laughs> go. I, I, at, at least the turkey on a pole match, people still talk about it whether it was in the absurd vein that it was so ridiculous. Uh, it certainly put Jake on the map, you know, forever, however infamously it might be. But otherwise, the other matches are, yeah, I don't remember them. I mean, I, I look back on videotapes, but when you think Team Challenge Series, I hate to say it, you think Turkey on a pole match, and you think Larry Zabisco screwing Jake Milliman out of a fictitious $1 million dollars and everything else is just kind of background noise, music. And and so on the overall, what was it? You know, I, I don't know. You know, one, one of many issues that the AWA had in executing the Team Challenge series was the lack of uh, long-term vision for the team challenge series, but that was pretty much how the AWA had always run. You know, it really did. Uh, the, you know, a couple of angles would be developed. Where, okay, we're going to do a six month run with uh, Hogan and Nick, you know, and pay it off at, at uh, uh, Super Sunday. But the undercard matches were, you know, there might be a run in on TV, you know, very basic setup. But the AWA was used to doing one or two angles that were promoted heavily and everything else was just filler material to get the two to three hours for a live event. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that carried on to the Team Challenge Series. And there's Scott Ledoux refereeing, there's Jake and Colonel De Beers is in the foreground. Uh, it sure. brings it brings back great memories, but at the same time, cringeworthy. Was there anybody in all seriousness who bought the AWA storyline that we're going to hold these matches in a pink okay. studio? And there's Tommy Jammer with, oh, my God. We're, we're going to hold these matches in a, in a pink studio, pink lit, backlit studio with no fans because too many of our guys are interfering in everybody's matches and we're going to have security stationed at the door to make sure nobody gets in or out. Come on. I, you know, Ray Charles could have seen that the AWA wasn't drawing flies at the time and everybody knew why this was taking place the way it was. Where, where was this filmed at, too, by the way, this this empty studio? TCN Studio, uh, Channel 11, WTCN Studios, or okay. Air Care 11 now. Okay. Um, Mick, you're right, but I, I, again, I will go back. And I don't, I, I don't want to put the blame on Nick, okay? He came in and was tasked with doing something vastly different. And, and for the record, make sure people know that you're not talking about Nick Bockwinkle. I absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think people might casually hear Nick. We are, we're talking about a, a Nick a production individual. I will refer not, to him as producer Nick for the rest so that people don't think it's Nick Bockwinkle. Yeah. I just have a weird but, feeling. We're going to get some comments from Nick Bockwinkle. He wasn't involved in the team. Talent, right? No, yeah. no, Nick. Nick wanted to stay as far away as he could from that one. But producer Nick was tasked with coming up with this vastly different concept. And I, I, he was given free reign to do what he thought would work. Um, there, God, he, for the open theme music, I remember he wanted me to try to mix classical gas with, uh, a Steve Miller song. Yeah, I, exactly. And and he wanted me to try to do this with, in, in, this is late 80s. This is before computers were easily accessible. And all I had was one inch and three quarter inch and reel to reel audio. Needless to say, that was never used. I think we might have incorporated 
classical gas into it. The, oh, by the way, let alone that we didn't have an ASCAP license to be able to play that music. Come on, Joe, you got a abr abracadabra. Yeah, but <laughs> Nick, uh, Nick, Nick tried. Um, you know, I'll give him credit for that. It, they, it was an interesting concept. Just the execution of it didn't work. In fact, it flopped and failed miserably. And could you put that Tommy Jammer clip uh, still back up there, Chris? So I, I've discussed this uh, on, uh, uh, on other podcasts that have had me on for the Team Challenge series. The chroma key with the crowd. So I, oh. I was told to go to a bar in the western suburbs of the Twin Cities, I can't remember the name of the bar, to go in there and get B-roll of a crowd and of them cheering and chanting. Now, okay, sounds good. Hey, you got the crowd there, you know, a, sort of a, a, a papered house, if you will? No. Uh, are these people aware that you are going to... Uh, they're going to be asked to do this cheering. No. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I go into this bar and uh, with my production assistant at the time, and I needed to get these people a even remotely interested in doing this B to get approval for them to be on this very strange AWA concept. And once that task task was done, to get them to try to do variations of them cheering and booing and everything as they're coming in. They really had no, not only they, I really didn't know what the hell I was trying to get out of them. That's just, that, that's an example of the lack of preparation and foresight, at least you know, presented to me to help produce this show. And so I did it. And if you go on YouTube or you happen to see the actual visual of this, the crowd is just it for every baby face, it's the same. The crowd's doing the same thing. And for every heel, the crowd's doing the same thing. It's like a video game. Uh, a very well, poorly done video game. Re wrestling, wrestling fans are nothing if not lemmings. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of the old uh, AWF Warriors of Wrestling taping, you know, but at least they had the foresight to go out and get a, uh, a day labor crowd and paid them, you know, six, seven, eight bucks an hour to boo and cheer. This sounds to me like you just went in there. You, boy, I tell you, Chupin, you really, between going in there and oil wrestling at the start and then going in and telling a bunch of drunks, come on and cheer for guys you don't even know, and I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. I mean, you really, you paid your dues, buddy. I've done some really stupid shit in bars over the years, but I got to say these two instances are, if not at the top, they're in the top five of stupid shit that I've done. In a you bar. are my role model. I'm <laughs> telling you, you you're, yeah, I, I was going to ask you this, Joe, and maybe Chris too, because, you know, Chris, you started kind of following the AWA at the time. And as you said, you didn't know any different. You know, this is, this is something you're seeing for the first time. It was innovative. Mm -hmm creative yeah the awa was not drawing anybody with the roster that they had and i i don't want to denigrate the roster at the time you, you still had the veterans hanging out you know larry zabisco and baron and sarge but you know you mix in guys like tommy jammer and tom beef burton and you know uh todd becker and whoever else you already weren't drawing with that roster when you were trying to set up angles. Now yeah. you're having these teams of the same guys you weren't buying a ticket to see anyway. 
vying for a mythical million dollar prize, which you're not buying anyway. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, they, they paled in comparison, guys, to what I was There's seeing with the W. By the way. Yeah, what I was seeing with the WWF, what we, what I was seeing with the NWA, you know, and and you know WCW, like the, the names were not big. The guys were like the performers were not as big. Yeah, I, I just I felt like okay, this was the AWA, but is this this is what it is, huh? Like this is kind of because I remember you know the you know Kurt had I remember like. Maybe a year or two before, yeah. This is kind of like where it really started to. This is where it started to really kind of click for me. Like, okay, this is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is that I'm watching, but it's not. I it's didn't not either. as good. <laughs> it's not as good as what the other ones were because it didn't have it didn't have the over the top personas that maybe that maybe it should have needed. Like I, and that's no disrespect to the guys that were in it. It just. They were working with what they had, but yeah, well, I Mick, I didn't know what I was watching, but I knew it right. wasn't Mick, it wasn't on par. In the beginning of this podcast, you had brought up all of the different names that were on the board that never saw the light of day in uh, the Team Challenge series. That was intentional, by the way. I mean, I remember sitting in the production meeting. Hey, we can put the names up there. Doesn't mean that they're going to be a part of it. We're not saying that they are a part of it. Let's just put it up there to try to create some excitement. And was it, was the was the intent always a bait and switch? Then I mean, not to sound underhanded. I, not so much a bait and switch as card I, subject to change. Yeah, yeah, you could put it under that category, but it, you know, you could include guys talking. You know, Nick Bockwinkel talking about uh, being the greatest champion and how Ric Flair isn't. Uh, you know, on a general promo while yes they did indeed wrestle those two championships were never going to be on the line in the same match during that era because that's not how wrestling was it was hyper hyperbole is what it was look at that picture there and for those of you uh that is that is not uh, samoa joe and his uh, high school picture that actually is the late Rodney Anoa'i, the uh, the late Yokozuna, and he was uh, Kokina Maximus in the AWA. He was also uh, around back then, not for very long. I would go back to what I said, Joe and Chris. If you have a roster that is not drawing people anyway, if you have advertised or at least led people to believe at the beginning that you might be getting Magnum TA or you might, you know, whatever it might be. And then you don't, then you have to have something that will get people interested in the product. And that's where you have storylines. That's where you have feuds. That's where you do your over the top uh, attacks in the ring, whatever it might be, cage matches, blood matches, whatever it might be. And they didn't mm -hmm. do that. They had, Matches that didn't make any sense, matches that were just ridiculous in their concept. How can it do anything else but but fail? Joe, you you put your head down when I had that picture up, and and Mick was talking, uh, and you were off screen. Why? I just remember the 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 name of Coquina Maximus, and then Mick came back and said uh, uh, something to the effect of. Um, um big back or whatever well the whole maximus part was because rodney had let's put it this way a song was written about it baby got back <laughs> and you know and, and coquina maximus the reason of the maximus part was the maximus posterior of of Coquina. So I put my head down in sort of laughter, just remembering back as to how he got his nickname in the AWA. You know, and again, I don't want to denigrate anybody. And this is interesting. Colonel De Beers, of course, was, you know, outside of Larry Zabisco, the Colonel at the time was absolutely the AWA's top heel. There's no question about it. What's interesting about this, and Joe, maybe you can take this a little bit farther. Sergeant Slaughter was the captain of one of those three teams we mentioned. It. Well, all of a sudden, Sarge is going to the WWF, and he's gone. 
Well, we need a replacement to replace Sarge as the captain of the team. What better guy to go to than Sergeant Slaughter's bitter enemy, the South African guy without an accent, uh, Colonel De Beers, who was all of a sudden thrust into the position of captaining Sarge's snipers. Again, it's just like, what just happened here? What alternative universe have we gotten ourselves into? Well, you got to put into perspective the time period of 1989 and how professional wrestling was. Uh, guys weren't under contract, at least in the AWA. Uh, Kurt Henning was the, the last one that was under contract. And so guys were independent contractors. They could come and go as, uh, as they saw fit. They were under no contractual obligation to stay. Now, in terms of Sergeant Slaughter, um, it was, as opposed to what Vince did earlier and grabbed Hogan and Mean Gene and, and uh, Dr. D, David Schultz and Jesse, you know, grabbing the those guys to hurt the other leagues um this was just a matter of timing you know in 89 the whole uh, all of the stuff with the middle east started and so vince wanted Sa uh, slaughter back and while i don't know specifically but i gotta believe that sarge was ready to get the hell out of dodge he was ready to abandon the awa for what had it had become because of the team challenge series. So my point is there, there is no solid structure. There was no solid structure in the AWA at that time. Okay. And so the team challenge series, part of the concept was the team challenge series was the angle. That was what was going to bring people in. It didn't matter who was going to be wrestling at the time or what the match was. It was all about the teams and who can get the most points and who can win this million dollars. Now, I'm not saying that I agreed with that approach, but that was the mindset. And you get into it so far you just roll the dice and say, you know what, let's just let's throw shit against the wall and see what sticks. And Eric Bischoff had a book, Controversy Creates Cash. I believe that was the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are um, 30 plus years later. And we're doing an entire podcast on a team challenge series. We're talking about the turkey on a pole match. And it's not just us, but it's discussed on other podcasts. For better, or in this case, for worse, the Team Challenge series did leave its mark. I would say, yeah, you're absolutely right, except controversy in this case did not create any cash no. uh, for, the, for the AWA. You know, it, it's uh, Jake Milliman, of course, you know, the storyline, uh, oh, God, Wendy Richter. Oh, my God. And, you know, she still looks great today. Uh, Wendy was even brought in to be, uh, you know, part of the Team Challenge Series back then. Uh, the, the highlight of the Team Challenge Series for me, Joe, and I've talked about this with you before, is when AWA legal counsel, Bob Ryan, <laughs> got into the ring with a briefcase, and I believe the briefcase had a million dollars in Monopoly money in it or something. And Bob, in his suit and his slick back hair and his horn rim glasses, came in and he, he tripped over the bottom rope uh, as he was getting into the ring on this nationally televised uh, Team Challenge series. That, to me, was the real highlight. Another one came years later at the Waterloo Hall of Fame. I was part of a, uh, a roundtable discussion, which included as one of the guests, Jake Milliman. And somebody asked Jake the question, Jake, you know, when you finally got your money back from, from Larry Zabisco, 
who tried to steal the, the $1 million from you and not split it with you, what did you do with the money? And, you know, and, and Jake said, and there he is, there's our, there's our buddy, Jake Milliman. Jake said, I spent it. All right. Well, okay. We, we kind of figured you would Jake. Jake's wife in the audience yells, not on me. You didn't. Huh. Where did the money go? <laughs> so that, uh, <laughs> so Jake me, uh, you know, I don't know what he did with that cash. I don't know what he invested in. Um, but, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that was another highlight, but yeah, again, I don't want to denigrate the guys that were there. They tried, you know, they did what they were told. They got in there, whether it was from Todd Becker to Larry Cameron to Larry Zabisco, right on down the line, everybody did their best with what they had, but you're not drawing people anyway you're using the same roster that is not drawing you're not using any angles other than the fact that like you said joe the team talent series in itself was the angle there, there was just no way this was going to get over now there they're right there there's another highlight of the team challenge series the texas hangman yeah i actually i one of the last teams that started in the AWA that actually got my attention. Yeah. Love the gimmick. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they, they were good in the ring. Uh, Rick Gantner and Mike uh, Moran, I believe. Mike Moran, Mike Richards. Yes. Yep. And, uh, oh, wasn't, uh, was Gantner one of the hangmen? Gantner was one of the hangmen. Yeah. And, uh, and Mike Richard, well, yeah, it was Mike Richards. He, Mike Moran competed in the AWA as Mike Richards before he, uh, donned the hangman gimmick. Gotcha. This is a tag team that, you know, scared the shit out of uh, Chris Tubbs, our producer. Yeah, it, yes, they, they did. And, and Mike knows it. And I think he still enjoys cause he's got that over me. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely well you know a lot of the a lot of the guys scared you is you know i understand back in the day you know but the, men uh, still scare me mick so, so, anyway. so <laughs> as he leaves so the <laughs> oh tubs what i gotta say about the team challenge series and the awa in retrospect for me it the AWA had become what a lot of the local, not a lot, but some of the local indie shows are now doing. They've got their core. Um, some may make it, some may not. And they've got, you know, bring in a couple of stars here and there for special appearances. That was sort of what the AWA Team Challenge Series was at the time. It, the only difference is that the AWA had uh, syndicated television, very good syndicated television, I might add, and ESPN. And I don't find it coincidental that the ESPN contract ran out during the Team, team Challenge series. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It was just... Hmm. <sighs> yeah, that, that that is interesting. So the, the Team Challenge series was running when the contract expired to the best of my recollection yeah we would have because that would have been 89 and that's okay. about when the espn contract um wore out now it wasn't because of the team challenge series but i don't exactly think that the team challenge series helped yeah with negotiations for an additional contract when you're oh, not right. even going into a venue that looks good enough for yeah. ESPN, like the showboat was, you're not going to, you can't put empty studio matches on ESPN. I mean, come yeah. on, Vern. Can you imagine if you're an executive at ESPN seriously and you're thinking about renegotiating or re upping the contract with the AWA, and then you see that pink backlit studio and you see, a turkey, a butterball turkey sitting on top of a pole. And no, I'm not referring to you at the bar, Joe. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're just going to say, wait a second. This is, uh, you know, no thank you. And again, I want to make this clear. And I know I'm being redundant here. 
the guys back then, and a lot of them came from Eddie Sharkey's Pro Wrestling America promotion when everybody else was bailing. They were good wrestlers. They mm-hmm. just didn't have the connection with the crowd. They didn't have the national exposure mm-hmm. at the time for the most part. So it just didn't work. Let, let, can, can I Oh, There's just bef- when we get up, when we leave. I just got one more little series of pictures I want to put up there. I know that there are some that we didn't get to, but there's just kind of ones that I know that you guys want to want to talk about. So Absolutely. I'll let you guys continue to, yep. to do your thing. And I mean, we'll go over a little over an hour. I mean, this is fine, but there, I think you guys know where I'm going with these last few, because you guys kind of talked about it before we started. Nick, to your point about uh, the talent, you uh, correct. hundred percent. Correct. Um, an analogy that I'll use is, the Red Rooster and Terry Taylor in the WWF. Just because the Red Rooster was as bad a gimmick as, in my opinion, that there's been over the t- over the years, doesn't mean that Terry Taylor was not a phenomenal professional wrestler. Sometimes the gimmick just doesn't it doesn't get over. Shockmaster, Goblinly Gooker, oh. I can name a hundred of them. You know. It It, just doesn't happen, but the guys that are behind it are good. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, nothing but respect for the guys that were there at the time. They were kind of swimming upstream. And, uh, you know, the AWA, that's, before we put the pictures up, I think that's what's, what bothers me, Joe and Chris, is that the AWA for newer fans who do not remember the glory days, of you know the 60s 70s 80s in those packed houses at the saint paul civic center and the fact that the awa at one time or another legitimately had every big name star that there could be in wrestling came through this territory and now fans you know take a look at at the team challenge series and they see is this the awa no wonder you know they went under and uh you know it's a shame because that should not be the lasting legacy of the AWA, but we had to do this show because it was a part of the history of the AWA. I find it very ironic that as you were talking about the how great the AWA was in the background, that Mad Dog started barking in the background. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, well, he, you agrees. Know, he may be an apprentice carpenter. You know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I, Chris, I, I think we got uh, we got some pictures. If I understood you correctly, ah, there they are. And I, I, you, you guys know where I'm going with it, but I know that the destruction crew as well. I, I feel for me, guys, was another highlight in that era of the AWA. I, I thought that Mike Enos and Wayne Bloom were. I mean, they were, to me, they were one of the can't miss parts of the AWA. They were. And the the following incarnations of Bloom and Enos, uh, you know, whether it's the Beverly Brothers or the, you know, coming in in mass in WCW, the destruction crew was the real deal. That, you know, they were ahead of their time, and that could have been really something going forward. No doubt about it. Agreed. Thoroughly enjoyed the interviews. Hold on a sec, Mike. I got this. But That's you guys got to explain this to me. Oh, boy. Come on. Uh, I mean, you got to just shoot it to me straight. Joe, what's, what's you start and then, uh, and then I'll follow up. So this was shortly after we got the chroma key card put into the Grass Valley 100. And all... All interviews were done on chroma key after that if, you know hey you spend the money on a shiny new toy you might as well use it and this if i'm remembering correctly would have been one it, it, one of the very early presentations of the destruction crew in front of uh, the chroma key wall subsequent shots were a you saw a demolished wall and that would have been well, the Curtis Hotel, but of course, neither were legitimate because they were green screen shots. But you know what? It worked, I suppose, for its time. Well, 
there there may be a little discrepancy though because the discretion crew turns around and they have sledgehammers and they are taking down the Curtis Hotel, which appears to me to be probably nine, ten blocks, maybe a mile away. Now, <laughs> now, possibly they threw the sledgehammers that distance. I don't know, the old hammer toss. I don't know. But uh, again, it's all about credibility, and it may have been a you know kind of a funny deal at the time, but I mean again you're looking at the hotel which is blocks away and anybody knows I... Mick, we're, we're, totally, we're totally doing a watch along with this by the way when we get that up and going we are doing a watch along uh, Mick, do you mean professional wrestling's work i beg your pardon <laughs> yeah, the, the, know, the, the, there was a lot just wrong I, I just put it that way it was yeah i mean i knew enos was strong holding up that you know sledgehammer in front of you at arm's length but i had no idea he could demolish a full-size <laughs> hotel from you know the next county I, I, they were they were tough they i were actually tough. remember i i directed that interview and when they turned around and did it i literally did i lol'd before i could even text i mean i just I think I might have snorted on that laughter as well, along the lines what you are saying, Nick. And it's like, uh, it's like, wow, these, you know, how in the hell are you destroying this building? And as they're throwing it, it wasn't video in the background. It was a, it was a still shot of the Curtis Hotel. That's correct. And then all of a sudden, the next show, they're in front of a bunch of rubble when they're doing it, and we know, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine the velocity and the torque on those sledgehammers to, you know, carry that eleven and a half miles? That's you know. hey, that's that's why they are the destruction crew. Uh, Nobody does it like they did. Well, so the AWA destruct just destroyed their own crew with this team challenge series. Yeah, what's the what's the legacy of the team challenge series for you guys before we wrap it up? <sighs> Um, I know, it's kind of a loaded question, but I mean, legacy for you guys is what? What not know. to try to do in professional wrestling. That Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you hate to think that that is the lasting memory of the AWA. The AWA's legacy is Nick Bockwinkle. It's Vern Gagne. It's the Crusher. It's Larry Hennig and Harley Race. Um the team challenge series, it, it's uh, it's a wart on the rear end of the AWA. There's no question about it. You hate to think that there are people really that look back at that and they think, ah, no wonder they went under. What, what, what were they trying to do? You should have been around for the 29 and a half years prior to that, and you would know the true legacy of the AWA. Well, I said my piece on it. It... it, it, it... <sighs> Maybe, I mean, Mick, you alluded to it earlier. Maybe the concept could work in this day and age. I wouldn't want to be the one to try it because of what that initial presentation did and how it's left its mark. I'm sorry, how it left its skid mark on the AWA and professional wrestling. I mean, it had its moments. I, the turkey on the pole match again. I mean, it's brought up, and yeah. to this day, people still talk to ask Jake about it. Uh, I want to know what he did with that million dollars. Well, you brought up. You said earlier that it was the suitcase was filled with monopoly money. No, it wasn't. Vern didn't want to spend the money on the monopoly money. It was just paper. Silly me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why, why, why spend 50 bucks to get a million dollars in Monopoly money when you can just put paper in there? It's never going to get opened up. Let alone trusting Bob Ryan to carry it into the ring. Now, by the way, Bob tripping on that bottom rope, he admitted afterwards that he was a little bit nervous. No shit. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, when you got a million dollars, apparently, you know, you have a right to be nervous. <laughs> I'd be nervous for the million dollars in a briefcase, too. Oh, boy. All right, let's uh, let's wrap it up with some shout outs here, guys, and uh, we'll bring it home. So, uh, Mick, why don't you go ahead and start? Anna Benson, my
my good friend of many years. She actually was involved in the wrestling profession herself on the local level uh, back in about 2000, early 2000s. Still lives in the Twin Cities area, still loves the business, although she's not a part of it. Uh, still goes to the matches and uh, very loyal to uh, pro wrestling. So Anna Benson, love you. The oh well, and he, he doesn't want me to talk. You don't want me to give you this, do you, Chris? And now, now he's muted. See how I'm doing this for the team challenge series. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to mimic that. It's a tribute. It. Very good. Very that's good. My, that's my tribute to it. Did you like? It? I wasn't. I've, I've been planning this. I've been just like waiting for the end of it to kind of go. So I was trying. I was trying to do it. Did I do good? You, you left a lasting legacy uh, for this podcast right there. Except yeah, my well, so, hey, it was a great run. Um, great way to end the, uh, the, the, the AWA Unleashed podcast series. This will be our last episode. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that a standing ovation I hear off in the distance? I, I, no, that was <laughs> just me coughing. My stomach oh. rumbling. I haven't had breakfast. My shout out goes to Kelly Dopp. Uh, Kelly had asked on uh, uh, our Facebook page who the oh yeah was in the open of the show. And it was answered on there, but I'll answer it here. Uh, it was indeed Pompero Furpo. It was not Macho Man Randy Savage. That Savage got that from Pompero Furpo. So Kelly, thanks for asking the question. It's now been answered. And I'm going to go with uh, Bill Klein. Bill, an avid uh, listener and watcher on YouTube, always asking questions, always has feedback, you know, good and bad, which we appreciate. So, Bill, I appreciate you being a, a loyal supporter since day one. And if you guys haven't, go to the YouTube channel, uh, subscribe, rate, review, or wherever, you know, platform that you're getting your podcast on. Uh, just, you know, leave us a review, rating, uh, just let us know. And uh, we got some things that are coming down the pike here, guys. So hopefully uh, within the next couple of weeks, we've got some announcements that, that we can make. But, um, yeah, I can't say any more than that. But this was – I think this was a show that needed to be done. And, it, I mean, you might not like it because it was at the very end. And I know we need to go back and spend some more time on other things that happened earlier in the AWA. But I feel like based on the feedback and what we were hearing – this was a show that I feel a lot of people wanted to hear about. So I, and it's one that I wanted to get your perspective, especially you, Joe, because I mean, you were involved in the production side of it. Don't like to admit that, but yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I, and I, I say that. Yeah. You say tongue in cheek. I mean, we, we know, we know. I, I, I was, I enjoyed trying something new in the sure. concept. You know, keep in mind in 1989, when this happened, uh, let's see. I was 23 years old, still young, wet behind yeah. the ears in the industry and whatever. And when producer Nick came in to do this, I, I did have a bit of excitement. I really did. Hoping that this could be something. Um, and I got to oil wrestle for free too. So, you know, there, it wasn't all bad, <laughs> but yeah, mm -hmm. but, you know, but it, it fell way short of what everybody had hoped for. And sadly, it left a bad mark on the AWA. Um, but hey, you know, live and learn. And hopefully what people have learned is to not try a modern day version of the Team Challenge Series. Joe, are you sure that that, oh, yeah, at the beginning of the, you know, in our show open wasn't actually you in the oil at the bar with the girls. Oh yeah. I knew it. 